Hi, everybody. Today, I'll be talking with Naomi Sternberg. She's a seasoned New York State licensed marriage and family therapist with 25 years of experience. In our, in our conversation, we'll be talking about her work in the foster care system, how she was able to carry those burdens, the, the difficult cases that she, that she tackled, and how her work evolved into becoming a family therapist, working with families, individuals, couples. Uh, we're going to also touch on her upcoming support group that she's going to begin running, uh, helping foster, foster, foster parents. So I give you Naomi Sternberger. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how, how did you decide to become a therapist? You know, it was later in life, you know, you were doing all the yeah. work. Oh, as I mentioned, I had uh, a feeling towards people. I was very, I had a lot of friends. I was very emotionally connected to a lot of different people. And I was a good listener. I really was. I didn't just talk and talk. I listened a lot. Yeah. And always said to me, you know, I feel much better. <laughs> you helped me a lot. And I was wondering, like, what did I do? <laughs> I didn't do anything. I just sat there. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I realized that just listening is important, also. And uh, you know, I, I have some friends who don't stop talking. I'm wondering if they're never going to be good counselors. <laughs> right, yeah. But uh, I was different than that, and I, I enjoyed the ability to help somebody. Also, it gave me a good feeling. So, uh, talk about symbiotic relationship. They needed someone to listen to, to have them listen uh, to, and I needed someone to help. So we work together. In other words, I was able to do that for myself and for the other person. Yeah, sure. So that, well, you know, what have you learned about yourself being a therapist? Just the way that you put that, you know, I, I, I kind of reminded, you know, Carl Jung would talk, would write a lot about how within therapy, there, there is, you know, it's not just that, symbi that, that symbiotic relationship, but, you know, that the development of the therapist with the therapy of someone else, you know, they're, they're, the work goes both ways. And so I just want to curious the way you put that made me think about that. You know, what, what was that like for you, you know, not just, you know, becoming a therapist, but then being this therapist and changing in your practice? Right. So the one thing I learned is, if, again, as a friend, you listen and you can give your opinion if you want. As a therapist, you don't do that. Okay? As a therapist, right. besides, you try to help the person make his own decision up without you telling them, you know, you need to do this, you should do that. Or a mother, I'm not a mother either. A mother can mm -hmm. tell the child to give instructions, but I don't really give instructions. Um, I, it's, it's called for, which is not always the case. As a therapist, you make your decision uh, based on the individual therapist therapy. But um, I was very um, careful. I, I, I learned how to make good boundaries mm. so that I would not uh, feel that this is becoming part of my life. I was able to work very hard on that and take whatever it was, leave it in the office and come home and that's it. Unless there was something I had to deal with afterwards and I had to figure out some solution. But most of the time, I did not have to take it home. I did have the same, I remember feeling the same angst that I used to feel when I did foster care. Like, oh, these poor children, how am I going to deal with that? Take them home. Someone's going to have to take them home and I don't know where they're going to go. And There were a lot of cases, I mean, where I knew there was a child molester in the community. Mm -hmm. And people did not know that and they took him into the house. And I had, I called them up and I said, take this person out. This is not a good situation for you and your children. And they started calling me from the Chumash and the Gomorrah and, and telling me how they have to save someone's life. It's our responsibility. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not a safe situation. And not everybody believed it. So mm. it's the old story, when you hear something negative, you don't believe it. Yeah. We've had many cases recently, we you know, that uh, came out with terrible, terrible stories. And there were people out there that said, how do you know it's true? Right. 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 Not the lie. It's all a lie. But, but being a therapist and working in the system, I, I know very well that it's true. And uh, that was hard. That was, a hard. that was a hard call trying to convince people that this man is not a safe person. And people would not believe me. I left Miami after that. I had moved elsewhere, I moved to New York, and did not continue the foster care program, being that I wasn't in that position anymore. And uh, I got calls from parents who had uh, adopted children, if I still could help them, and I wasn't doing it anymore, so I could yeah. not help them. Right. So I felt, I felt good that I had done that at the time, but it was like a different role in my life at, at the point that I was living in New York. Why did, you, was, why did you leave the work? Well, I, my husband uh, was in, had a different position. He was a physician, and he had a job as a clinician, in, main head clinician in uh, Williamsburg. 
So uh, being with the HMOs and private practice was getting a rough, rough deal. So we, mm. we made a move to New York. Uh, one of the couples that I did teach were Orthodox. And they had grown children already, but they wanted to start sort of a new family. And they were curious how this would be. And they joined this group, this parenting class mm. amongst single mothers not single my single women who did not have any relationship with anybody, just yeah. wanted to have a child or uh, couples. And this Orthodox couple, they were not from here. They were from a different country. They were not from Israel. They were not from uh, Miami. And they were different, different country. But they were very eager to help Jewish children. And I subsequently gave them these two kids I just mentioned, this uh, Jewish mother was not able to take care of these two children and they were first as a for, they were the first forced to care children in this home mm. and i would visit them every week and uh, help with the parenting skills and instructions and give them support because it was a very difficult time yeah i think they realized they, they got more than they bargained for so they had a they had a it was up to the up to the top of their heads right. what they had to of them. They, they were, the schools were nice. They, had this, they were Jewish children. They were enrolled in a, in a Jewish school, not necessarily an Orthodox school, but yeah. a community school in Miami. And they were bright children. However, they were disturbed. They were definitely disturbed. Yeah. In any case, I had a different position uh, working for a Jewish agency doing counseling in schools of all sorts, uh, elementary and uh, high school different cultures, Hasidic, Bukharian, Russian, uh, modern day schools, and yeah. um, regular Orthodox Huge day difference. schools. Huge difference. I mean, was, was uh, very it? Different, very different, but I, I tell you that it was a much easier program for me. I didn't feel the pressure. I didn't feel the, uh, the angst about feeling that I, I, this is so much. It's just it, you, you take home the problems as, if, as a clinician, you learn to separate your what's going on outside, so you shouldn't take it home inside. But it was very, very heavy. Yeah. And I did not want to get that forced to care program. And there's, there's oh hell in Brooklyn, and I know when people work there, I, I know that they get burned out. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, mean, so like, I felt I did my there, and I did what I could, and I, I, I was done with that. However, this story with this couple that I mentioned that meant and adopted these, these foster care kids, they did adopt them, and they became their children and their family. And uh, when I moved to Eretz Israel, to Israel, I got a call from the mom. She knew for some reason how she knew. I don't know. Maybe Google. Google knows everything. Right, yeah. And it was here and asked me if I could see the kids again. But we're going back wow. so many years. So that's an interesting story because I hadn't seen them, I'd say, uh, 20 years, 15 to eight, maybe 18 years. And uh, and I saw the kids again. I mean, they're grown up. And one was married and divorced, and uh, which is what usually happens when a dysfunctional family has children like that. Right. And they had the best care. They were brought up in a very loving home. This, this couple was a very loving family. But there were issues that were not resolved. Right. Yeah. What do you suppose that is? You know, with families that, you know, this, this is intergenerational issues that, that that are pushed forward. I mean, how do you? How would you explain that? Well, well, first of all, if you have a mom who's ingesting alcohol and drugs, it goes through the placenta into the fetus. So there's a alcohol fetal syndrome, mm -hmm. and that affects the child's brain. So that's one issue. Then there's the emotional part. If even if a child has that, if you don't have a stable, disciplined, loving home, consistent, you don't have the attachment issue. You don't have any attachment. So you grow up as to survive. And survival means you do whatever you have to do to just get what you need to get. So these kids did very well in the home that was the foster care adopted home, but however, they did not do so well outside the home. It's they were. They had a irony, a, a home like that, and then going into normal life, and that being difficult. Had, yeah, yeah. They never really recovered. I mean, they did. Sometimes they did better than others, and some things they did better than others. But for the most part, they never really recovered. 
there's always this backlash of fear and, and, and lack of trust and lack of security and stability, which they always incur throughout their lives. And that was very sad to me, but that's the way it is. It doesn't happen all the time. I mean, I also dealt with a woman who had adopted two Jewish children from Israel, lived in America, and these children were in a better position. The mother was functional, but became um, ill. We couldn't take care of the children and, and needed to let go of them. Mm. And she agreed and to uh, let another family take them and adopt them. But these kids were brought up in a better home in the beginning. The caretaking was much, and my experience has been that most of the foster care parents who have had the children in their home, these children are really hurt and damaged. What, and it what, takes can, a what can foster parents? What can foster parents do to to make that less likely to give to give these kids that are coming into their home a, a better chance as opposed to pushing that on to to say you know their their grandkids intergenerationally speaking. Well, foster care parents can can do by giving the consistency and routine and discipline and lots of focus and concentration on them, meaning that there has to be, they have to know the strengths of each child, and each child has strengths, and that's important to know, because if you think that these child are only just damaged goods, that's how you look at them. If you look at them in a different frame, and you look at them as children who have abilities to, to soar and to grow, then you're giving them hope. And, and every child needs hope to know that he's worth something and he has con should gain confidence. So that's a, a foster care parent's role is to give the child confidence, not feigned confidence such as, oh, you're the best in the world, or you're the smartest. That's nonsense. And the kids pick that up. But confidence that they can do what they have to do. And again, to know their strengths, whether it be socially or intellectually or aesthetically or spiritually, you tap into that, and that's what a foster care counselor would do, is tap into those sources and maximize their potential so that they could be able to soar and grow properly. Yeah. And I saw that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. And look, you get attached to these children. They're, they're precious children, whether they're Black or Chinese or Spanish. They're, they're, they're children, and it's, it's hard. It's a hard call for them. And... Um, I, I, my heart breaks for them. There's no question about it. As I said, when I changed my position in New York, uh, it was a different, different thing. I you know, was a counselor in a school, yeah. and the therapist and the family of the, of the kids of the school. It was a total break. I wouldn't have to take any of these feelings, feelings home. I was just separated totally because it wasn't so intense. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, even working with kids is tough, you know, seeing you know, the, 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 the tough situations they're coming from. But, yeah, foster care is a whole different level. All right, I enjoyed teaching the parenting classes. They were, the parents were very, very receptive to one to, to improve the children's lives. And, and that's the thing is you have to notice when you um, have parents who are foster parents that they have to be excited about what they're doing. They shouldn't be forced into saying, well, I want to become a foster parent because uh, that's what everybody's doing. That's not a motivation to uh, take a foster care child. And that's what I'm saying about this couple who eventually yeah. adopted these two. And they were very motivated and very excited about that concept of helping a Jewish child. Right, 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 right. Really develop. So that, those are the things. So when I interviewed parents to, or people who wanted to become foster care parents, I was always wondering, why are they doing this? Because it's a very selfless mm. type of devote to other people, and it's not—it's not like you, you're taking care of a dog. I mean, not against dogs, but right, yeah. you don't have to put it to, to level. Yeah. So, what, what, um, what were some of the, some of the motivations? You know, I, I imagine people came with all sorts of different you know backstories to what was pushing them forward to become foster parents. Well, if you had a single woman and she didn't have a family and she didn't have a relationship with anybody, she needed to fill that hole, a vacuum. Now, that, that in itself was a question to me, whether that was selfless or mm. selfish. In other words, if she uh, wanted to do that to help her child and help herself, that's fine. But it was only to fill her own gap and her own needs. I wasn't pleased with that comment. 
because that meant to me it was just uh, a use of, just to use somebody for the sake of uh, filling her own needs mm. and not filling the child's needs. So that was, I, as I said, I motivate. I was only motivation had to be the number one reason for again taking in a child. Yeah, and and I wanted to know the background of each parent. In other words, if a parent uh, or a single mother, single woman, single. I didn't see a single father. I saw single women. Uh, if their background was dysfunctional, that would not be a reason to give put a full secure child in there. Now, as opposed to the, um, the secular system of full secure, I, I believe that they're on call and they don't really uh, do a whole, total thorough examination of their background. Mm. Many of them for their money. That, that's a, that's a, mo a strong motivation, the financial gain. Right. Correct. So, in other words, somebody would say to me, well, it's, it's good money, I would say, oh, really? Okay. Is there another way that you can make a living besides doing this? Right. So, I, I wanted to know what their motivation was. So, I really asked a lot of different questions. But I had to be, so, that, again, if a single person who didn't have a life was doing this also for the sake of the child, then that would be a consideration. And you see a lot of single women who are wanting to do this to, to be foster parents, as opposed to family? There are. Are there are single women who, who have missed their calling as being a mother, and um, or maybe they feel sorry they never took that opportunity, mm -hmm. or maybe they didn't want it at that point, right. and realize and they maybe have friends who have children and are enjoying graduations and uh, celebrations of all sorts, and they're not uh, enjoying anything like that. And they, they feel they want to be important. I, I have a woman that I recently dealt with. She had no life. She had two boys that she was not married. This is not Jewish. And um, she just felt her life was empty, but she wanted to give. She was a very giving person, despite the fact that she was not married and she had her own children were grown already. Yeah. She, went, she was a person. I had asked her lots of different questions. And she had this need to uh, fulfill someone else's needs. Sometimes it's a symbiotic relationship that... I feel your need, you feel my need, and it works together. Yeah, yeah. So it, it did work. It did work. She has this child, even though he has to be on his autistic spectrum. He's on mm. the Asperger's autistic spectrum. Yeah. She loves dearly, and she works very hard, and she's very fulfilled. And she's not an old woman, but she she has no life, and she doesn't want to have. In other words, she's not interested in having men in her life at this mm. point. She just has this real strong need to take care of this particular child. Were, were you and seeing, I find it... Were, were, you, were you seeing all these women that were professionals that, that had developed their careers first and then were doubling back to try and fill that family void? W was that more the the flavor of where these women were coming from or or not necessarily? Sorry, I missed that point. What did you ask well, I, was I was curious. You're saying, you know, single women and later in life and they missed their calling. I guess I was curious. Yes. You know, did you find a lot of these women were, were first developed themselves professionally and... and found themselves at the cost of family being professionally successful and then realizing, wait a second, something was missing or not. Or it was, I mean, is that, was that a, a, a pattern you were seeing? Yeah, that I saw that too, that they had a profession and a career and then, but it wasn't enough. But I also saw a need to do something in life. And then sometimes when you have, you're living in, as life goes on, you, you mature somewhat, I hope. And you say, what am I here for? What am I doing in this life? What am I, what's my purpose here? Right. It can't just be work. It can't just be partying. It can't just be fun. There must be a purpose in my life. So this is a purpose to help another human being. It's a purpose. Yeah. And these, these females, these people, these, these couples felt very, had a strong need. Some people have this need. Some people don't. I mean, there are people who take in Down syndrome children from the hospitals um, I, I know of such a woman who gave up her child. She realized her child was Down syndrome. She left him in the hospital, wow. did not take it home, and someone came and adopted this child. Now, you ask the same question, like, why would somebody do that? Right. They're very giving, and this is need to protect and care for other people. Some people have a very strong need. And, and you see throughout the Jewish community specifically, I, I believe it's other communities also, but specifically in the Jewish community, there are people who will go out of their way to take care of these children. You know, especially, you know, with the emphasizing that, you know, taking on the selflessly, you know, another another human life. You know, I'm curious, you know, what you were seeing with people who were 
like in your story here, you know, kid with Down syndrome, you know, the, the, the parents, you know, leaving the kid in the hospital. I mean, what, what were you seeing with what was motivating folks to, to step aside, you know, and to, and to give up their children? Such a powerful human need, like the survival well, of the children is, is, I mean, that's, that's paramount. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm really curious what, what you were seeing with what, what, what was the decision making looking like for these people? Well, don't forget there's also something called shame, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of shame in having such a child. Not for everyone. Some people understand that it's God's will, especially if you're an Orthodox Jew. You understand that this is what it is, and there's nothing to do about it except to do the best you can and help this child grow properly, maximize its potential. But there are other people who feel very strongly that this is a shameful thing for my family. Wow. And I cannot deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. And I don't, I, no. So this woman went around saying that her child died. She never told mm -hmm. anybody. In other words, it became a secret. And secrets can uh, erode uh, family life. Yeah. But uh, I have to say that she was able to keep it a secret. I, I, mean, I know the secret, but her children never knew exactly what happened to this child. She just said it was sick and it died and that's it. The child was adopted. And I mean, I don't know what happened after that. Sure. So the shame is shame, strong. Shame is the big one. Shame and, and the how and, and the full thing themselves that because of them this child was brought into this world. They blame themselves for this. Not that they did anything wrong, but how could God give them such a child? They, they probably punish it. It's a punishment. So a guilt also. Guilt. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I would have suspected you would have said something along the lines of, you know, financially, you know, it's hard to have a kid or they, they, you know, was, you know, backed into a corner, you know, in that way. But, I mean, shame and guilt, I mean, those are, those are deep. Those are deep. Deep roots in the brain and the, in the uh, somatic, yeah, situations of the body. Very, very deep core. Jeez, and the money was maybe appointed in some homes, but not necessarily in most of the homes. And there were a lot of kids left in the hospital. They really were. Mm. All kinds, disabled kids of all sorts. I mean, have you seen the have you seen the needle shift in terms of, you know, people feeling shame for, for the kids that they're bringing into the world? Right. So they feel shame. They feel like, how am I going to manage? It's I need help. I don't want to get help. I want I want to be independent. I want to be strong. I want to have a good life. These are feelings that people have and, yeah. and they're fine but it doesn't always work that way and, and sometimes you're dealt a, a different hand and the choices are to deal with it or not to deal with it right. so and these people did not deal with it well and it probably was better to give up the child because it would have ruined their life the way they felt about it and they would have been resentful and angry and bitter and it would have affected the rest of the family so yeah, I, it's not a judgment call, but in this case, what I'm yeah. talking about was the best thing for this particular parent because uh, it would have destroyed her. And she has to live with what she did. That's a different story. Oh, yeah, and th this was how many years ago you were you were doing you were doing this work. So we're talking about thirty years ago. Thirty years ago. Do you, do you think that's changed within thirty no. years? <laughs> no. The different, the only that's changed is you now know the history of your your, your uh, uh, family of origin, your mm. actual parents. Before yeah, you were not allowed to learn the anything kids. about that. I, it was a, and one of the main things I remember when a foster care child we were talking about history, when you fill in an application, you have a history of what the family is like. Mm. Did they have heart conditions, uh, diabetes, blood pressure issues? Blank. It was always blank. blank. They knew nothing. And that was very hard for a foster care adopted child. Like they had no knowledge of their former life. Not having a history. Or their origin. That was very, very painful. So that changed. So now they are able to get a history of the former parents, the birth parents, and know where they're coming from. If they had some some of the children liked spaghetti and didn't find out that the parents were Italian until much later. Okay. Yeah. So that made sense. Okay. So that was almost cute. But um, so I went this couple who adopted these two children, it wasn't until they were living in Israel that they contacted their family of origin. Mm. There was no emotional connection at all, mm. but more curiosity 
I, I'm your son, I'm your mother, I'm your daughter, but hello, how are you? And I, you know, that's about it. There was nothing to talk about. But they had, they were curious and, and interested in what to do, how to find them. And they found them. It was amazing. Yeah. And I, I, they talked to me about it. And, but that was it. Very little communication after. I think they spoke another three, four times and that was it. How, how, did, how did foster families themselves, you know, you're saying one of the, one of the major differences, you know, the, the, the kids' history becoming more, more, that they're more aware of it, that it's more on the table. I mean, how did the foster parents themselves deal with that? I mean, it was, do, they, do they find that challenging as a general rule, trying to integrate a, a kid's, kid's history into their own and their own, you know, family narrative? Or is that, more, is that clean? Like, what, was, what, what were you seeing in your work? Well, when they didn't know who, who the family birth, uh, birth was, the birth, birth family and the family of origin was, then they were very lost, confused, unsettled. Like, who's my, who's my real father? Now, sometimes, and not in my, I mean, not with me, I didn't have that experience. You know, that people who adopted children never told them. Mm -hmm. And somebody outside the family mentioned it to them, not knowing that they didn't know yeah. that, that was a a shock. That was a horrendous shock for the child, children. Children were very angry, and they ran away. But I, I, it wasn't my experience, but I know that happened. Yeah. So the children need to know where they're coming from. They need to know their roots. They need to know who they are. They need to know if they look like grandpa or grandma or Uncle Sam. They have to know that. They can't just have blank in their history. It's very disconcerting and yeah. very discombobulating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So children are not uh, pieces of the furniture. They're, they're, they're hearts and souls and minds and body, and then they just need to be like every other child. Sometimes the children would make up stories. Oh, wow. If, it, if a child would be, uh, a child's father would be in jail and the mother was sick and he was in the foster care, he would make up stories. Mm. And oh, my father's a lawyer. And he's uh, has makes a lot of money, and he just can't take care of me, because that's where the shame would come in. Now, I don't want anyone to know that my father is a criminal, or that my mother is uh, a drug addict. How how would the foster parents themselves relate to that? I mean, I imagine you know, like they'd have some inkling, you know, who this kid's parents really were, and they're probably coming from tough tough situations, being aware of that. I mean. Was there any mm -hmm. sense of, on your end having to deal with you know, this sort of anger and bitterness from the foster parents' end? You know, this indignation. I said, and when, I, when the kids were adopted, I had to make, I had to write a tremendous report, almost like a book on each yeah. family origin. So that's what they had, which wasn't enough really. To tell, told them bits and pieces about their original family, but you, but you couldn't see their faces. You didn't know much, you know, the real truth about them. It was just a history. Mm. But the foster parents and the adoptive parents had to work extra hard and giving them the confidence and the stability to understand that you are still worthy and still have a lot of hope ahead of you and you will make it. And this was part of the point here to instill this feeling of hope and, and aspirations into those children. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it wasn't easy for me. Right. We succeeded more than others, depending on the background again. The attachment issues were stronger in the infancy stage and the early stages, the children did better. If not, they did not do so well. Yeah. And this uh, throughout their lives in their new relationships, and then many of them got divorced um, and started again until they, they had to go through counseling many, many times. Mm. I and mean, I would say years, years, yeah. years of. And it hit a crucial time. For instance, if a child become a teenager who was a foster care child, all of a sudden they realize the identity crisis becomes apparent at that age when you become a teenager. And many of them started cutting themselves. Okay. Wow. To release pain that they had. And uh, some went on drugs and some did crazy things like road racing and uh, irresponsible things. Yeah. To more than a regular teenager would yeah, be yeah. in that stage. So that they had to really they had a lot of pain in there. Like, why was I rejected? Why was I abandoned? Why didn't my parents love me? Was I not good? Is it my fault? Those are very strong feelings. 
And even though the foster care parents did love them and adopt them, adoptive parents loved them, there was that piece still missing. Why did these parents get rid of me? Why couldn't they take care of me? Right. So, it, it, so when they would raise their own children, uh, they couldn't understand here. They would feel very strong feelings towards their child. They couldn't understand how someone in, in their family would get rid of them like that, toss them aside. Reconfronting, these, reconfronting. Yeah, yeah, that reality. Yeah, it's, it's right, a terrible it's right thing here. Gravi said he's gra out. Is, is right here gravitated towards very dark cases. Like I'm just like talking to you and listening to the things that you're describing. I mean, not not every therapist is interested in doing that sort of work, you know. I mean, you know, anxiety and phobias that, that's one thing, and that's tough. And you know, there's plenty of human suffering there, but that's nothing like dealing with kids and you know, saying, you know, sexual abusers and the things that you're listing off here. I mean, why do you suppose you don't shy away from that? That people shy away or therapists? Why do you Why do you not shy away from that? Well, I, I, it became my, my life while I was working in Miami. That was what I was doing, and I just wasn't going to just give it up. The yeah. reason I had the opportunity to give it up was when I moved away from it. And I said, I saw the difference, a different type of life I was in. It was so much more calmer, right. less exasperating. So I said, I, I've done what I've done. I've done, yeah. accomplished what I need to accomplish in Miami, and now I'm done. And I'm moving on, moving on to other things, which I did. Yeah, you knew your limit, and that was life changed. How did you, how I didn't did you? want to burn out. That, that's a big thing, because I, as I mentioned before about oh, health, people do burn out. The cases are heavy in the Jewish community. Yeah. How, how, did, your, how did your practice evolve when you moved to New York? You know, aside from, you know, those sort of the cases come into the side, you know, what, what were you doing there? So, as I said, I worked for the Jewish Aid Agency, and I, I worked with, in schools, and I would go to different schools every day, different school, yeah. and uh, I worked with children. I bring my packages of um, Ikea, big giant bags of toys and games and, and uh, coloring books and all kinds of activities for the young children. And uh, for the older children, we talked a lot. I mean, I learned about the Bukharian culture because I dealt with the Bukharians a lot. Yeah. And that was not to me. They are, they're a culture into itself. Huh? Very different. They're Jewish, but they're, they're very, very different. Very different, sure. And I, I actually, I happen to like teenagers. I find them very exciting. <laughs> They're very passionate about the craziest things. <laughs> it's an understatement. Really like, teenagers, exciting, you know. I, I mean, they can be passionate about whales. I mean, whatever it is, they'll just pick something and then they'll, they'll go for it. Yeah. I've enjoyed listening and talking to them. So that was interesting. But then I evolved to do mostly couples and I would do... The schools in the daytime and at, at mm. night, I would also see couples. And again, it was all kinds of, because I worked for different agencies, I also saw blacks and mm. um, Spanish. I had a lot of experience with blacks and Spanish from Miami, so I was, yeah. I felt comfortable. And no problem with that. And uh, again, different lives and uh, different expectations, but I enjoyed that. I loved it. So, and then I, and then I also was taught parenting classes, either step parenting classes. Mm -hmm. Or regular parenting class. Of, I didn't do foster care parenting anymore because that that was from Miami. Yeah, yeah. But in New York, I did the regular parenting classes and step a lot of step parenting classes, which was another story in itself because blended families are very difficult to deal with. You may have the couple itself may be very loving and attached to each other, but putting two family, two children, two set of children together is very difficult. Yeah, what's the challenge with that? Resentment of each child mm. to the other children, the uh, connection to from one from the mother to the hard children and the father to his children, and the balancing act was tremendous. Really, it was uh, it, it broke off a lot of uh, relationships. It was almost impossible. If the if the adult children were not involved, when the two adult children were they were married yeah. or out of the home, there was a better chance. You know, these couples making it. But if they had young children to deal with and a, a large families, uh, they had to be very special people to be able to withstand mm. the constant pressure. If you're not my mother and don't tell me what to do, that type of thing. Yeah. But sometimes it, it wouldn't work. And I mean, they're not when, necessarily uh, their mother, but I mean, they're the adult on the scene. I mean, how, 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 how would, how would step parents, how could they, how could they handle raise kids you know, 
being being in that role, having to make sure that they're safe, at the same time defending against that problem. You're not my mother. Why should I listen to you? You're not my dad. Who who cares? You know what 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 can well, first of all, So the couple had to be strong with each other. I have to be make a statement that they are. That's it. What mm -hmm. mom says or whatever, when you want to call her by first name, whatever you yeah. wanted to call her, Jean says or what Alex says, then that's that's it. And if you have a problem, you come to me, we'll discuss it. But it, it's you don't come to me and tell me he, she mom said this and uh, and I and you expect me to back lash at her, which I'm not gonna do that. Yeah. Or the opposite. Mom said that, uh, that Alex said this and, and and I don't like it, he has no right to talk to me like that, and, and she has to say, Well, Alex had a point. To, to make to you and I want to find out before I say anything or do anything. So they have to be tight with each other. They mm -hmm. can't just assume that what the kid says is that's it. It's God's word. Because kids are very manipulative. Oh, they, they, my so kids they don't do that to feel, me all the time. They'll ask my wife, you know, and she says no and they come to me and it's like, hey dad, what do you say? And I, what did mom, what did mom say? You know, like I don't let them get away with it. You know, but there's an added layer. I mean, there's an added layer that, that you're dealing with as a step parent though is that is that uh, why should I listen to you anyway? You're not. I don't care about you to begin with. Why should you be bossing me around? Yeah, I don't know why you're in my life altogether. The fact that they can be very, very nasty, but they're straight. They're honest. They, they tell you what it looks like. They mean what they say. That's true. But again, if the couple is strong with each other, it'll work. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know kids, the kids? Do, I mean, do they? You know, how much do parents? How much do the kids realize their parents are lonely? you know, being single. I mean, is that no, something not even? Not at all. Not at all. The only time they'll realize it was when the parent is older, they prevented the parent from getting married again. Oh. And they'll say, ah, too bad we didn't let dad marry Jean. That's when the guilt sets in, is when they're older and they see, you know, older they need care themselves. And, and, and they're just really not doing well. And they say, wow. If he had um, a wife, maybe things would have been turned out better. But of course, it's too late. You can't bring the clock back. Yeah. But they never realize it's, it's it's very rare that a child will say, you know, we have to do the best for mom and dad. If you, if mom needs to get married, then that's the best thing for her. Or dad needs to get married, that's the best thing. They will do everything possible if they're old enough to understand to undermine and sabotage the relationship. And they've done it. They've been successful at that. Is it, is it different if a, if a parent passes away? You know, because I'm reflecting like, you know, my, as, as you're talking, like with a divorce, you know, both mom and dad are still there and you're left with maybe one day they'll get back together. But, uh, you know, say That's one parent true. passes away. Is it, is it different from... from it's a little bit you that uh, you hit the nail on the head. They're hoping constantly to have the parent remarry. Unless the other parent remarries already, and obviously there's no more hope. But even that won't change the fact they still want, um, they don't want mommy or daddy to remarry. They want mommy and daddy under their control mm. and do what they want. And then the, as a result of that, uh, mom and dad who are left alone uh, feel guilty marrying because it, it's a pull. That you don't care about me, you want to just care about yourself. The guilt, they, they know how to set the guilt in. This is what we want yeah. to call Jewish guilt, whatever we want to call it. They yeah, know Jewish how to guilt it. usually comes from the mother, but not nah, comes from the kids too, yeah. Brother taught it well. So. Right, it's in the genes. It's in the DNA, yeah, right. So that, it's a go, the kids tell the parent, you're, you're not, uh, you know, you're selfish, you don't care about us. And then the parent feels lousy and, and thinks right. about it and thinks, yeah, I better stop going off and, and then meeting other people. And I just better stay home with my children until they marry. And then when they get married, I could look into, into someone else. But of course, by that time, they're, you know, it's how old. And life is not going to just hand them a package. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Sometimes I do miss the opportunity to move out. My, my, sense, of, is it, my sense is mostly, mostly uh, women that hold out to get remarried. You know, there is that guilt of, you know, wanting to be there for their kids and not give them that instability. I mean, I mean, from what you're saying, I guess, like, is is there really that payoff? Or, I mean, how would you no, react I, to that? I think that they, it's, it's individual, but there are women who, they really do want to get married. If, they, if, it's, a divorce, if it's a widow and she had a good marriage, there's an, a need to uh, either replace that person or, or not. Mm. And that's, again, individual. But for a widow, for a divorcee, 
if her marriage is really bad, she may absolutely not want to be married because it's been such a dysfunctional marriage right, okay. and so much baggage that she just, and being in therapy, even she just can't handle it. But there are women who do say they want to remarry and it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Right. For who knows? I mean, it's not like everybody's outside waiting for someone else to meet. Right, right. Something that doesn't happen so easily. Right. We know that. But before, but shifting gears here real quick, I, I wanted to make sure we talked about it. You know, your, your support group that you're going to be running. Yeah, I, I want to hear, yeah. you know, if you tell everybody what, what, what's the support group, you know, how is it organized, who is it for, you know, what, what can people expect, you know, if they, if they join up with you to, to participate? Well, the expectation is such that I want to help these foster care parents work better with their children, foster care children, mm. and give them, give them confidence because if I give them confidence, they can give their foster care children mm -hmm. confidence. They may feel insecure or inadequate as like them knowing what to do or how to deal with them. So I want to give them the tools and the skills to understand what they need to do to help these children grow and maximize their potential. That's a big one. I always talk about maximizing potential. Yeah. So that, that's one key. The other key is to understand that these kids are manipulative and, and not, mm. it's not that all kids are manipulative, but these kids are. This part, and uh, they, a, everybody's got a little they, demon in them. Yeah, right. And they will test. They will do things that are not necessarily good things. They might even, even do, I mean, if you're talking about a real dysfunctional child mm. in a foster care home, you might even set a fire. And then the, the foster care parent will say, hey, I'm not doing this. It's not what I, I bargained for. And the child will then say, you see, they don't love me anymore. Nobody loves me, no matter what. And not because he'll blame himself, because that's not what he's doing. He's saying, nobody loves me. Everyone's trying to get rid of me. There must be something wrong with me. And that only intensifies his dysfunction to do it over and over again. Mm. He's constantly testing. Now, that's an extreme example, but there might be other things, lying, cheating, stealing, or running away. Uh, acting out in school, beating up children, beating like up every, the children. Every, every parenting nightmare concentrated into one, one yeah. big stew. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of things. Might, then there might be a child who might be the goody goody. You know, mm. dysfunctional children, uh, dysfunctional families, they have this perfect child, the clown, the happy child, the uh, scapegoat. They're all different kinds of roles that one put in, mm. in the dysfunctional family. So this child may put on a different role. He might feel like a, a never mm. and act like a never and, and be very needy. Or another child might be perfect. He's always doing well in school. He's picking up the things in the house. He's cleaning. He's shopping. He's taking care of mom and dad. So it, at one time or another, it's, he's going to explode if he just won't be able to handle that. Yeah. It's a limit. But the child can be a parent. He can't be the parent if I figure too long. He's only 10 or 12. So the child takes on different roles in a foster care system. And so I would alert these parents how to understand what the, what the signs are, what the red flags are, and what to look for. Now, there's always a honeymoon period, as it is with mm. any relationship. Right. Just wonderful and hunky-dory. That doesn't last too long. Once the child is more comfortable and the parents are more comfortable, things do happen. So I, I, that is another thing I would alert the parents about. There's a lot of things to learn about. I mean, if they haven't gone through foster care parenting classes, so these are the things I would help them. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Do, is that is that uh, something standard in Israel in general? I mean, within the Israeli foster care system, I imagine like is is that something incorporated through through the Revacha? or I, and do they really they service about Anglo? Here, I have no idea about the system here. I just know what I know from the system before. I would hope they would be. Um, assessed and uh, looked into very carefully before they yeah. would be considered care parents. I hope so, but I don't know. I didn't a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people I see I've worked with, you know, they'll, they'll be struggling with these social workers and, you know, either the social workers really don't speak English or, Correct. Correct. you know, you get this, you know, 25 year old who's never had a kid and he's trying to tell you how to, how to be a parent and, you know, breathing down your neck with every little, you know, how, is that, is that something people can also, is that going to be part of your, your support group as well, dealing with how to, well, how to, I, how to feel I, the social work? I, I don't think I would be going to their houses, but I would I could definitely get a call from them if they needed help with something. I would definitely uh, help them with that, yeah. talk to them about it, or give them advice and suggestions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
No, it's a, it's a huge need. It's a huge need, you know, being able to have, especially just it being in English, you know, with so many right. people just not able to get that sort of thing in English because everything, I mean, it's, it's Israel, it's, you know, Hebrew, but still it's like, you know, so many people here just can't, can't effectively even advocate for themselves to get those sort of services and then to push back when the social workers here are being a little too rough. Right, right. And there are many people not even in the foster care system. They're just taking in children because of mm. whatever happened. Sometimes a family member died and they took in their children because okay, yeah. nobody else them. So yeah. they may be healthy children, but still they're in pain. Right. There are a lot of Right. So say the, say the, yeah, say the sister taking in her younger siblings and things like that. Right. Yeah. And they need to be counseled. Nobody can get away with it without being counseled. Right. All these children support system, other than the family, they need to have someone to talk to about things they cannot talk to with other people, with other family members. And it's really important. Yeah. So, I so remember I had yeah. a student who was whose father, mother died of cancer. She was young. The mother died young and the father had a nervous breakdown, so she was taken into an aunt and uncle, and then the aunt died of breast cancer. Oh, gosh. So she had to live somewhere else. So she was shifted back and forth into the Hasidic family. And uh, she was very normal. She was the one who was a perfect student, mm -hmm. a perfect child, a perfect everything. And they wanted her to get married at 16, 17, something like that. And she was frightened. She was yeah. very, very, very anxious, understandably. She yeah. had anxiety panic attacks and uh i worked for a whole year and she became calmer and she understood her role in her life as a, as a Hasidish and young mm -hmm. driver young young girl and uh, she she was doing very very well she really was and, wow. and i was very happy to see that because she, she was a lovely human being I and mean, she wasn't her fault what happened it was life is challenging what can i say some have it more than others but it's very challenging for her yeah. she invited me to her wedding and, and as a rule i don't usually go I went and you I went. Yeah, this was a different case. Yeah, yeah. Purple, and I, we danced, and I, I just left after that. That's but beautiful. It was a very special time. Yeah. Really so, so the program's on July nineteenth on Tuesdays. Is it every week, every other week? How? What's the frequency of the group? I think well, we'll talk to the group and we'll see. Okay. We'll see how it's out. If they want it every week, we can do it. If we want it once a month, I, I think I want to see what they ha what they have to say, what their designs are, and what their needs are. And so what what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to put your contact information in the in the the notes in the in the in the notes of the video and you know everybody interested you know check out check out the check out the notes there and you can get the phone number and email for for you you know listen I really enjoy talking with you this is you know amazing <laughs> stories yeah. just amazing <laughs> stories that you had and it sounds like this Thank program you. is going to be really something that a lot of people could really get a lot out of you know very useful hey, Brett, very that's useful. great to hear yeah. All right. Okay. Take. Okay. Thank you very much and have a good day. We'll call it a day. We'll call it a day. Bye.